And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome from St. Louis, Missouri, in the home of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. My name's Tom Pansella. Welcome to Preventing Teen Suicide, What to Look for, What to Do. I'll introduce our speaker to you in just a moment. For those who've joined us before, welcome back. Those of you who are new to this kind of program, welcome. We're glad to have you with us today. If you're interested in purchasing CEUs for today's program, there is a link underneath the video window. And you'll see several links down there underneath the video window. And a couple of them are uh, registration flyers, information for a program if you're anywhere near the St. Louis area that's going to be going on here in this area. And Sarah will describe that to you as part of the, part of the presentation today. There's also a link to the PDF, a PDF file of her slides. If you'd like to put those up in a pop-up window or have those, you can have that link as well. I just tested it. It's working, although I did hear a couple people were having a little bit of an issue with that. It's a big file. You may have to be patient watching that download into your, into your window there. There's also a link, of course, to the Department of Mental Health Spring Training Institute program. We put that up there because that's a big program, and if you're anywhere near Missouri, we'd love to have you attend that program coming up at the end of May. Also, if you're interested in submitting a question or other feedback during the presentation today, there is a chat box right under the video window. There's a button there that says chat. Don't hit that button. That's going to ask you for a login. You shouldn't have to do that. You type your comment into in right next to where it says say. You hit that blue say button, and that'll submit your question or your comment. The first time you do that, you might have to give yourself a nickname, but beyond that, you shouldn't have to do any kind of login. So now I'd like to introduce Sarah Strawn, and she is the School Outreach Project Manager for the CHADS Coalition in Mental Health, and she's going to tell us all about CHADS. That's a St. Louis-based mental health organization. It aims to educate adult, students and adults on the warning signs of teen suicide and depression. Sarah began her Master's of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. She finished it at the University of Missouri with an emphasis in secondary education. She's got significant experience working with youth in many different areas, such as character development, justice education, creative expression, and service initiatives. She now oversees all school programming for the CHADS Coalition and was recently awarded the Community Suicide Prevention Award from the Missouri Department of Mental Health for her efforts in educating the public on this important topic. Besides that, she's quite a fine actress on the side. <laughs> <laughs> and Sarah, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm glad to be here and presenting this seminar on preventing teen suicide, what to look for and what to do. Most of the information I'm going to be sharing today is specific for school staff in terms of what they can do, but I know that we have a lot of different types of people out there from a lot of different professional backgrounds, and I want to say that all of this is applicable in, in each of your interactions and your roles with, with kids, with teenagers and adolescents. So keep that in mind. So some of it might seem, seem a little bit more specific to school staff and teachers. I just want to give you first off a little information about what we're going to be covering today. I used to be a middle school teacher myself, so I love knowing where we're going and having those objectives. First of all, I want everybody out there just to kind of gain some basic awareness of this topic. So teen depression and teen suicide, there's a lot of myths. There's a lot of Mm, things that we hear in the media that we think to be true that really aren't. So we're going to cover some of those statistics and some basic information. After that, we'll move into the meat of the presentation and we'll talk about what to look for in terms of what are those warning signs of suicide, what are those symptoms of, of depression, and how do we identify those in the kids that we work with. Then we'll talk about what you can do. So what is your role in assisting students who might be struggling? And then lastly, we'll talk about some additional resources. Now, I know we have people from all over the country, so a lot of the resources we'll be talking about will be, will be focused on the St. Louis area, but we'll also give some websites for those of you to be able to go to as well. So just to give you some information about CHADS Coalition, this organization stands for Communities Healing Adolescent Depression and Suicide because that is our focus. But it's also the name of this young man that you see right here. This is Chad McCord, and he was a high school senior at a local St. Louis high school. And his senior year of high school, he was doing really well in all ways, academically, athletically. He was incredibly gifted, was a junior Olympian, Eagle Scout, had a great family and lots of close friends. But in October of his senior year of high school, despite all of this great greatness in his life, he did say that he was struggling pretty significantly with depression and thoughts of suicide. So his family tried to help him and Chad did want to get better, but unfortunately he did die by suicide in April of 2004, about a month before he was going to graduate from high school. A couple of things came out of this. Um, obviously his parents were very grief stricken, but they knew that they wanted to use what they'd been through to help other families. So they started this organization because the entire time Chad was sick and was trying to get help, he continued to say, you know what, we talked about so much in school. We talked about drugs, we talked about alcohol, we talked about all these risky behaviors, but we never talked about suicide or depression. So he grew up really feeling like he was the only one that dealt and struggled with those issues. 
and he said, when I get better, I want to go before my entire school and tell those kids what I've been through so that if one of them out there was going through the same thing, they would know that they could reach out and ask for help. Now, unfortunately, Chad was not able to fulfill that wish, but that's why our organization exists, so that we can spread this awareness and bring education and knowledge to youth, to youth workers, to parents, to everybody out there, so that they're just going to know what to look for and also how to reach out and ask for help if they need it. So now we are focused on the St. Louis metro area, but we are a statewide organization. And at the end, I'll tell you about some opportunities for your school or your community to benefit from some of the work that we do. So here is a symposium that was held. Um, and if you read through those things, basically this is stuff that we would consider to be true today. Some concerns that were raised about youth suicide. We have alarming increases at times. We have media sensationalism. There are clusters of suicide, meaning after one suicide in a school or a community, sometimes there tends to be a couple soon thereafter. Schools are the best place to intervene, so where can we reach these kids? Where can we talk to them about this topic? School is a very natural setting to do that. Also, we know that students are under extreme pressure, and all too often, guns are readily available to youth. So again, these are things that we might talk about today, but this symposium was actually held in 1910 by Sigmund Freud in Vienna, Austria. So despite the fact that we talk about suicide as being this thing that's right now and plaguing our youth today and it didn't used to happen a long time ago. That's actually not true. It's been something that's been occurring in our society for a very long time and we're still working very hard to address it. So some statistics and these are uh, specific to Missouri so I apologize to those of you who are not here but most of the statistics in Missouri are pretty much national statistics as well. They're very comparable but we know that in 2008 there were 775 suicides in Missouri which is about an average of one per 11 hours and 20 minutes. We also know that it's the third leading cause of death and this is national for 15 to 24 year olds and we know that more children die from suicide in the 15 to 19 year old age group than the top six medical causes of death combined. So more deaths than cancer accounts for or juvenile heart, heart disease or diabetes or anything like that. A few more for you. One in 16 high school students report having made a suicide attempt sometime in the last school year. And so we know statistically speaking that can be anywhere from one to two kids in each class. We know that males complete suicide four times more often than females do, though females actually attempt suicide at a rate three times higher than males. The reason that more males are dying by suicide is because they typically tend to use more lethal means when they're attempting. So this is a specific graph, and this is about the St. Louis metro region, and this is a suicide rate for 15 to 24 year olds from 1998 to 2007, broken down by sex. And this is something that kind of goes to dispel one of those myths that suicide is always increasing. If you look at the graph right here that you'll see that that's not the case, but in fact it's kind of all over the place. There's not really one particular trend. There's not a steady increase nor decrease. The only thing that we can gather from this is what I already said, which is that more males do die by, by suicide than females. So this is taken from the Mer Missouri Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, which is a statewide survey many states actually take, and schools can opt in to take it to analyze their, their students' risky behaviors. And out of Missouri, we found that 14.8% had seriously considered attempting suicide, which averages out to be about 3.5 per class of about 24. We also know that 10.8 students reported making a suicide plan sometime in the last 12 months. And 6.3 had actually gone as far to attempt that suicide. Now out of that 6.3%, 11.4 of them had made a suicide attempt so serious that they actually had to get medical attention. Now this is kind of a good and a bad thing in terms of the fact that only 11.4 had to get medical attention. It's good because we know that that means that those students are not making attempts so lethal that they even have to seek help in terms of a doctor or emergency room visit. But it's not a good thing in the fact that if those 11.4% are not, or the rest are not getting medical attention, we then know that maybe nobody knows that that even happened. So maybe last night they tried to take too many Advils or painkillers, whatever they had in the home, and the next morning they woke up and they were here and they were fine, and therefore they didn't tell anyone, not their parents, not their friends, not school, somebody at school. So potentially nobody even knows that that attempt happened. 
This is taken from ASSIST, which is Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. And this is a really great training for people who want to know more about how to intervene specifically in people's suicidal ideation. And this is talking about youth and adults. So I encourage you to look that up if that's something you're interested in. But this is talking about what we're seeing in terms of how many suicides are being reported. And it illustrates that what we are witnessing or what we know about is just the tip of the iceberg. We know about what's reported to be a suicide. We know the statistic rates that are out there published by the CDC and other similar organizations, but we don't know about all the other things below that. So first of all, we don't know about suicides that are not reported to be suicides. So if there's a minor, the family might choose to rule it as an accidental death. It might not be reported as being a suicide. Or we might not even know that that's what actually happened. So we're talking about single car accidents and there was no suicide letter written, so we're not sure if it was or not. Maybe it wasn't, but there's a potential that it was. So there could be several more, anywhere from about 5 to 25 percent more suicides than actually we know of. Even hidden deeper below that are the non-fatal suicidal behaviors, and this is talking about suicide attempts. So this is very hard to measure in terms of research and to um, get an idea of how much greater it is, but a few ones that we've seen here, obviously it says 40 to 100 times greater, meaning there are 40 to 100 times more suicide attempts than completed suicides. But we've also seen a statistic that says for every one suicide completion, there are 900 suicide attempts. So you can see there's a pretty big variance in that statistics because it's pretty difficult to track. Below that, we have the number of people affected. So simply how many people are being affected by someone's suicidal attempt, suicide completion, or suicidal thoughts. This is family members, this is friends, this speaks to those clusters, so maybe a school community has a suicide and after that we don't know what that effect might be. There might be from that more kids considering suicide depending on how that school handles it or depending on what that does to affect their own mental health and their way of viewing life. Below that and hidden very deeply are people with thoughts of suicide. And sometimes these can be people that we least expect. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later when we, we specifically address our signs of suicide program, which is the one that we use in the schools in this community and state. So to speak a little bit more specifically to suicide, a lot of times the media paints it to be this very impulsive decision, especially when we talk about youth or teen suicide. So this horrible event happened, a breakup, a bullying situation, a parent's divorce, and now this is what I'm going to do. But it's important to realize that typically that is not the case. Suicide is typically actually very much a journey. So first, that idea is conceived. The bad is now outweighing the good. I don't want to be here anymore, it's not worth it, so what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to do something about it, I'm going to make a suicide attempt. So they first have to get to that point where they're actually even making, having that idea come to mind. From there, they would begin to work out that plan. So how am I going to do it? When am I going to do it? Where am I going to do it? And do I have means to use what I say I'm going to plan to use? So it's important to realize that from that point, that that plan, that idea is conceived, it can be a wide amount of different times from the time that the idea is conceived to the time the, the attempt is actually made. So it could potentially be a matter of hours, but it could also be a potential, potentially days, weeks, even months. Teens might have something that they're looking forward to. Maybe it's a senior prom, maybe it's seeing a younger sibling perform in a play or, or be in a state championship, and they want to make it to that event. Or maybe they want to make it through the holidays because they don't want to make it difficult on their family. So the reason I tell you this is it's important as somebody who's working with youth to realize that you could potentially have a very long period of time that you could witness those warning signs, witness those symptoms, and intervene and stop that youth from making that attempt. We also know that typically suicides do occur in the afternoon or the early evening, usually, unlike common belief, actually in the spring, not in the winter or the holiday months, and typically in the home where that person lives. And again, I said this already, but uh, just to lead into our next slide, it is usually precipitated by, but not necessarily caused by triggers. So maybe there was something that happened and that was the last thing that that teen could handle, but usually there's a lot more that goes into it. We refer to suicide as being a multifactorial event. And that's what you're seeing right here. So I encourage you to just kind of look around this circle to take a, take a glimpse at all the different things that could potentially go into somebody having thoughts of suicide. And depending on the role that you play with a student, maybe it's a teacher, a counselor, maybe it's a, a, a youth worker, or maybe even a chaplain or something like that, you could 
potentially know of some of these, but there's a lot of them that you're probably not aware of. So especially as a teacher, you might be cognizant of their life stressors. So what exactly is going on in their life at that point that's really difficult for them, but you're probably not going to be super familiar with their neurobiology. So here's the thing. Suicide is very complex. We can't always explain it. We don't always know what goes into having those thoughts. We can't exactly pinpoint it, but we do know that there's a lot of potential factors playing a role, and it's not just that event, even though that's typically what the media paints it to be. This was taken from Thomas Joyner, who's a sociologist, and he created this model of suicide risk. And this is typically targeted towards adult adults, but we can also kind of use it when we analyze what puts a youth at high risk for suicide. So I want to emphasize that this is not about putting somebody at risk, this is putting somebody at high risk for a suicide completion or at least a serious suicide attempt. So if you take a look at this, you're going to see two circles. And on the outside of that circle, he created this because he said, you know, there are somewhat of 200 different odd factors that go into somebody having thoughts of suicide, and that is too big to analyze. So he kind of narrowed it down to focus on this. First of all, that desire for suicide has to be there. Um, it becomes an option to that person. They begin to seriously consider it because, again, the bad is outweighing the good. They don't want to be here. And that is paired with what you see in the blue circle. First, this idea of being a burden. So I'm more trouble than I'm worth. I don't add anything. I'm not good at anything. Why am I here? My friends don't like me. I'm always fighting with my parents. My teachers think I'm a pain. So just this idea of being a burden on people. And on the other side of that, we have this thwarted belongingness. So I don't belong to anybody. We know that the sense of belonging is, is a human, humans need that, and especially teens. They need to feel like they belong to their friends. So if they're not feeling like they belong to a school community or a sports group or an arts collaboration or a group of friends, that can be really difficult, especially if they've been shoved out of that. So maybe they've moved to a new community or maybe their friends have deserted them for some reason. And this is where we can see bullying kind of playing a role as well because if somebody is being consistently bullied, they might not feel like they belong or anybody even wants them around. So that blue circle in and of itself puts somebody at a risk, of, risk for suicide. If the desire is there, they feel like they're a burden and they don't belong, that puts them at risk. But when they're at high risk is when this yellow circle that you see overlaps. And that is coming from an acquired capacity for suicide. So when we talk about an acquired capacity, we're talking about a couple of different things. First, we're considering are they desensitized to violence? So potentially they're not scared to harm themselves. They're not scared at what it would take to actually die by their own hand or something like that. Um, sometimes we talk about self-injury being tied into suicide, but it's important to realize that self-injury is not always suicidal. So we actually sometimes call it NSSI, non-suicidal self-injury, meaning that it's not really connected, but instead it's a negative coping mechanism for kids to deal with pain. They feel that physical pain, so they don't have to experience that emotional pain as strongly. But basically we talk about being desensitized to violence. It doesn't scare me to make this attempt. Then, on the other side of that, do they actually have means to do what they say? So, if somebody is going to make a seriously lethal suicide attempt, they're going to potentially use a handgun. That's very lethal. But if they don't have access to that handgun, then their risk is going to decrease just by the nature of access. So, again, when we have this acquired capacity and this blue circle, which is the idea of being a burden and not belonging, when those two things overlap, that's what puts somebody at an incredibly high risk for suicide completion or at least a serious attempt. So now we'll get into what to look for. We kind of did our an awareness piece, and now we'll move into as a youth worker or a parent or a teacher, whatever your role might be in these kids' lives, what can I look for in terms of warning signs of suicide? So we'll talk about these first. Obviously, we know that mental illness and suicide are, are very closely related, and especially serious depression. So if you're working with a child, a teen, an adolescent who is showing you that they are severely depressed in and out every day, they have a low mood, they don't feel good, they're always down, they're always sad, they're maybe tired, they're grouchy, they're irritable, and that's not relenting, um, that's a serious sign of depression, which is a risk factor for suicide. Below that, you see this pessimism or hopelessness. And especially as a teacher or somebody who's working with kids in, in a, on a project or something like that, how do they address themselves and how do they address their skill set? 
I'm so bad at this. I'll never be good. I, I'm not good at anything. And it's, I don't even know why I'm trying because this is pointless. I'm never going to be good at it. So how do they think about themselves and how do they address what they're trying to do? Especially, we talk about behavioral shifts. So if you had a student that was a pretty decent student, they didn't have to be a straight A student or anything like that, but they could just be an average student and they tried pretty hard. And then they move into this self-defeatist attitude out of nowhere and they can't snap out of that. That would be a behavioral shift and that's showing us this pessimism and hopelessness. Another thing to observe is withdrawal. A lot of times when people are depressed, they tend to pull back from their social circles. So if that's a teenager, are they pulling back from their friend group? But on top of that, how are they behaving in the classroom? Are they, when they can, removing themselves and sitting off in the back? Or maybe you have assigned seating, so they can't do that physically, but they're doing that emotionally and socially. So they're having a difficult time engaging in group projects or in whole group discussions. Obviously, sometimes we have introverted kids who just behave that way because that's their personality. But again, we're looking at, did they not used to act like that, but now they do? You can observe that as well in the lunchroom or if you're working with younger kids on the playground, something like that. How are they behaving in these social situations? Are they pulling back? Are they actively engaging? Another one would be sleep problems. Now, obviously, you're only going to be there to witness sleep if you're the parent, but if you're a teacher or if you are a coach or working with kids during the day, you can maybe observe the sleep problems because maybe they're falling asleep in your class. So if they're not sleeping at night because they're either incredibly restless, they can't turn their brains off so they stay up all night thinking and worrying and pondering things, or maybe sometimes when people are depressed, it doesn't matter how much sleep they get, they're just always tired. So if they're falling asleep in class, if they're not able to exert energy during that practice or rehearsal because they simply don't have it, that can be a big indicator of depression because they're not able to sleep. They're having that, those symptoms of fatigue. A few more we see right here, and some of these are a little bit more difficult to observe. I wanted to start with the first ones because those are ones that you can pretty much see firsthanded. And these kind of depend on your relationship with the student or the teen. The first one you see here obviously is increased alcohol or drug use and I always use the example of the fact that I taught 7th and 8th graders and it was incredible to me how much information I could find out if I simply walked around the room and did not make eye contact. It was almost as if, if I wasn't looking at them and, and showing them that I could hear them, they assumed I couldn't hear. So I always tell teachers and school staff members it's important to know how much information you can pick up just by being an observer and being a silent observer at that. So how much alcohol and drugs are they using? And obviously any of the kids that we're working with are probably below 21 so they should not be using substances but let's put that aside for the moment and realize that there's a huge difference in the fact that there's a huge difference, sorry, between social drinking and drinking to do what we call self-medicate. So if a student is using alcohol or drugs to alter their mood, that is a serious indicator. And a lot of times, because kids might not know that they're depressed, they just know that they don't feel good, that they don't like themselves, they don't like their life, they don't like their situation, they might start to use alcohol or drugs just so they don't have to feel that way. And that's a big warning sign, that's a big indicator. Impulsiveness and taking risks. Some kids, their personality makes them big risk takers, makes them impulsive. But we're talking about using these aspects in a negative way. So somebody might not be quite ready to make an actual suicide attempt, but therefore they might, might want to leave their life up to chance. So they engage in very risky behaviors, driving very recklessly, um, putting themselves in compromising situations late at night alone in a dangerous part of town, um, self-injury, things like this where they're, they're putting their safety on the line, not necessarily to make a specific attempt, but certainly to just kind of leave it to maybe this will happen and, and that might be okay with me. Talking about suicide or a wish to die, now this is a, an obvious one, but unfortunately a lot of times, especially when we talk to kids about this, they say, well, I, I just didn't take it seriously. That person wouldn't, they wouldn't actually do that. But if somebody makes a suicidal remark, that is never, ever something that you want to just assume they're saying offhandedly. I was at a conference a couple days ago with a teacher who said that she was teaching a class and had two young people writing essays about suicidal themes. And she did not know if this was autobiographical or if it was just something that they wanted to write about, but she went ahead and turned those essays into the counseling staff so they could talk to those kids. It turned out being fine, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. We don't know that it was fine. We don't know if that kid was actually projecting something that they were going through on paper or not. So it's always better to be safe rather than sorry. This one right here, making a plan, 
meaning that sometimes the mood lightens. So if you've been working with a student for a while and they've been depressed and they've been down, and then all of a sudden they seem to snap right out of that, we would love to think that actually they are feeling better. Maybe their medication is kicking in, their therapy is kicking in, or maybe they're naturally just doing okay now. But sometimes, especially when they've been in a deep depression for a while and they seem to just randomly come out of that, that could actually be because they've made a suicide plan. And that mood lightening is coming from the fact that they're feeling a sense of relief. I'm not going to have to feel this way anymore. It's going to be much better. I'm not going to be here. So they're actually feeling a little bit better, not because they're naturally better, but because they're seeing an end in sight. A few other ones for teens specifically, giving away prized possessions. So if they're giving away things that are important to them, to the teachers, to the friends, coaches, people that they care about so they'll have something to remember them by, that's a big indicator as well. We know saying goodbyes is also one. So if somebody, I've really appreciated everything you've done for me. Thank you so much. You've meant so much to me. None of this is your problem. It could be elusive. It could be direct. But if somebody is saying goodbyes and it doesn't really make sense, that's a warning sign. Obtaining means of killing oneself. Now, this is not something most of you probably in your roles with students would be able to observe, but it is a warning sign. So if somebody has been working on gathering things to make the suicide attempt, stockpiling pills, asking their friends, um, you know, for maybe a particular weapon or something like that, that's a big indicator. An unexpected rage or anger, especially with adolescent males. When we talk about depression and suicide, we of oftentimes equate it to feeling really sad and down and unmotivated. But it can also come across in, in anger or irritation or frustration. Are they acting rageful? They didn't used to act like that. Now they're very aggressive in class, that sort of thing. That can also be a warning sign. So the connection between depression and suicide is d between depression and suicide is very, very, very strong. We know that 90% of youth suicides have some indication of a mental illness. So 90%, the vast majority of the time, that youth that's dying by suicide has had some indication of being depressed or having another mental illness. And typically it is depression. Now when I present this to students, I say, you know, that's actually good news because that means that the vast majority of the time that kids are dying by suicide, it's because they have a diagnosable and treatable condition. Condition typically being depression. We know that depression is highly treatable by both counseling and medication. But also we know that exercise can play a huge role. So regular exercise is so important. It's naturally releasing those endorphins in the brain and it's very instrumental in preventing depression. We also know that if people are depressed, it could be harder for them to pull themselves off the couch or get out of bed or get up that energy to go do some kind of high cardio exercise. So that's why sometimes medication can be that first good step to getting better. And then after they're starting to feel some of that energy come back, take it over from there with, with exercise. So these slides are important simply because they start to dispel this idea of, of depression just being a choice or a character flaw or a weakness. Unfortunately, that's a huge barrier to a lot of people, not just teens and adolescents, but also adults reaching out and asking for help. It's okay to ask for help if it's something to do with you know, your heart or having asthma or diabetes. We want to get better, but if it has to do with your mood or your behavior or your brain, it's sometimes a little bit scarier. And I think as a society, we're moving to a point where we're, we're more apt to ask for help, but we're still not quite there yet. So we show these slides because we want to show the fact that obviously right now we're looking at a picture of two very different lungs. We have one cancerous lung and one non-cancerous lung, and we can see that there is a physiological difference shown by this medical image. So when I show this to middle schoolers and high schoolers, I ask them, is it this person's fault that one of those lungs looks like that and one of those lungs looks like that? And they always, and they always obviously say no. So then we switch to this slide right here, which we're seeing a medical image of two brains. And we can see that there's actually a physiological difference between a brain that is depressed versus a brain that is not depressed. In this image, we are looking at brain activity. So obviously, there's a lot more brain activity occurring in the non-depressed brain than in the, the depressed brain, which is accounting for those outward symptoms, why they might not have a higher energy level, why they're experiencing fatigue, why they might be more irritable or sad or down, or why they might want to withdraw a little bit more. And that's what's causing that person to feel that way and to behave, yet, and to behave that way. So then I ask the students, okay, well, if your brain looks like this versus this, is it that person's fault? And then at that point, they all say no, and they can see that just like any other physiological disorder or disease, this one as well needs help and needs, needs reaching out for that, and there's no shame in it whatsoever.
So let's talk real briefly about some symptoms of clinical depression in teenagers. When I show this, it's a little difficult because we think to ourselves, well, what teen has not been irritable or what teen doesn't complain about some kind of physical ailment, especially when they want to get out of class or something like that. But the important thing here is that there is a big difference between what we call a typical teen and clinical depression. And it's what you see on this slide. The fact that depression is not something that somebody can just snap right out of. So it's going to impact their life. It's going to impact potentially their schoolwork. It's going to impact their relationships with other people in terms of their peers and also their home life. Now, it's also important to recognize at this point that some kids are very good at hiding how they feel. I told you Chad's story and I said Chad had been struggling with this and he'd actually admitted that this was not anything new when he started to experience that his senior year, but in fact he could remember having his very first thought of suicide in the third grade. So from about age 8 to 18, he'd been struggling without telling anybody, but more importantly, without anybody noticing. So when we talk about this, it, you know, obviously we would like to be able to identify these kids very easily, but sometimes they get really good at hiding how they feel and pretending to feel differently. So most of the time it will impact these things, but not all of the time. And unfortunately, we tend to recognize things in retrospect more so than we do when they're right in front of us. But when we talk again about the difference between being a teen and clinical depression, we talk about not only is it impacting the quality of life, but also they're consistently exhibiting signs. So we talk about frequency, duration, and intensity. Are they experiencing three to five of these signs at the same time for at least two weeks at a time? So how many, for how long, and to what degree? And that's when we can start to tell the difference between depression and being maybe moody or just going through a rough time. So just a few takeaways in terms of depression. First of all, we know that sometimes depressed people may try to self-medicate, and this is what we see with increased alcohol and drug abuse. We also know, like I just said, sometimes it can be somebody that you least expect. And so the first step to being able to identify these students, these adolescents, and also adults is just being aware and having the basic knowledge. And then also we know that most research has shown that depression is typically the result of a chemical imbalance, which is why medication and exercise can be so helpful in treating it. But obviously, importantly, depression is treatable, and we need to hold on to that hope. So another thing that just wanted to clear up real quickly is that I get this question a lot. So if there's a connection between depression and suicide, what does that exactly mean? While it is true that most suicidal people are depressed, it is not true that most depressed people are suicidal. So it's important to make that clarification. So we talked about now what to do, or sorry, what to look for. Let's move into what to do in terms of how do we prevent these two suicides from happening. Um, there's a few things. First thing, right now, just by being here, by logging in, by taking an hour out of your day to raise your own awareness and your knowledge, that's a huge step. So just by knowing your stuff. Oftentimes, like I said, people say, wow, well, if I would have known that was a warning sign, then I would have realized it. Now, we can't beat ourselves up about those situations because they tend to be very obvious in retrospect, but not so much in, the, in right here in front of us. But by knowing these signs, maybe you'll start to identify it a little bit easier. Also, by providing care and support, no matter what your role is with a teen, it's important for them just to know that you're approachable, that you're there. In the school community, sometimes kids say, well, I was afraid that I would get in trouble if I told somebody that I was thinking about suicide. So making sure that you have that relationship or at least that presence with them, that they know that you can come to them if they have a concern. A very effective way to prevent suicide, obviously, is basically to restrict access to lethal means. So that can't really happen in the school setting and you might not even have lethal means there but in terms of at home or an extracurricular facility if you're worried about somebody restricting those lethal means is very important and we also know that effective treatment like counseling medication social support and mental and physical health so getting that regular exercise all of those things can be very helpful in preventing suicide now here's the good news the fact that we can make a difference Nobody out there, none, not myself, um, potentially the people that are listening are not experts. And the important thing to realize is that you don't have to be to make a difference. And so now I'm going to move into some very basic things that you, no matter what your role is, can do to help these teens. 
So this is um, taken from an organization called Screening for Mental Health, and this is the program that we use called Signs of Suicide, or SOS. And we've tailored this to go from a technique that kids can use and made it to be a technique that adults can use. And when we talk about identifying somebody who needs, who needs help, so a teen that's maybe starting to show these warning signs, maybe you're not totally clear about it, but that's okay, you can follow these three things, ACT, to get them to that help if they need it. A stands for acknowledge and it's two-tiered. First, you acknowledge that they need help to yourself. So, okay, this person now has been skipping class pretty regularly. When they're here, they tend to fall asleep. They're not engaging in their normal activities, and um, they don't really seem to be spending time with their friends anymore. So there's four signs. And have they been showing them for a while? Yep, it's been about two or three weeks. So I'm starting to get concerned. You have two options at that point. You can write it off and hope somebody else is helping them or assume that you're just over reading it or looking into it too much or you can actually address it and so I would encourage you to address it obviously so you go to that student and you talk to them but you're calm you're direct and you're supportive and you say okay I've noticed this and an I statement is always very helpful not you've been skipping class and you've been falling asleep so don't make them feel like they have to be on the defense but approach them in a way that makes it seem like you genuinely care about the situation hey, listen, I'm concerned because you're not acting like yourself, and I've just noticed some different behaviors that you've exhibited lately that aren't you. And list some of those. Be very direct, like I said. Make sure that you're stating specific things that you've noticed and you've picked up on. So hopefully that acknowledgement step is going to open the door for them to talk a little bit more. It's not always going to. And what I will say to you is if that first time it doesn't work, continue to observe and be persistent. Have that conversation again in a couple of days or a week. Maybe they're not ready to have that conversation with you yet, and it's just going to take a little bit more. So once they do open that door, and maybe they start to talk to you a little bit about wh what they're going through or uh, what their concerns are, care. And that's a simple step. Show that you care. Show that you're genuinely concerned. Again, don't make them feel like they're going to get in trouble for talking about this. At this point, your main priority is to make them feel like they're in an environment where they can tell you honestly and openly what they're struggling with and what they're going through. So after you've listened a little bit, the important thing to remember is that you should not have to, nor should you try to, especially if you're a school teacher or if you're not in a mental health professional role, you shouldn't feel like you have to do this on your own. So tell. If you're in a school setting, tell that school counselor or social worker. Maybe they're already working with them. Um, maybe they can provide some additional support. If you are the school counselor or social worker, link to the administrator or go to the parents. So if you feel like the parents need to get involved, that's, uh, that's always a good step. Maybe the first time you don't feel like they need to, but pretty shortly thereafter, if this continues, they might not need to be notified. And remember that no matter what community you're in, you're not alone in supporting these students. So you could potentially have parents or foster parents. Um, you could have school counselors, teachers, administrators, coaches, other mentors in their life, like other family members or family friends. So remember that you can use a community to support these kids with obviously still respecting their privacy. So we acknowledge that these kids need a little bit of help, we show that we care, and then we tell somebody. A few things, and this is just going to be um, specific, it says school staff support, but I encourage you, um, I won't be able to address each of your professions, but I encourage you if you're reading through this, and I am specifically speaking to school staff, to be able to kind of apply this to your own career. You know what you do best, so try to pull that out a little bit. So the first thing that's important to realize is that if somebody is depressed, they oftentimes, again, like I said, might not feel like they belong or might not feel like they have much to offer. They're having pretty intense signs of or feelings of worthlessness. And so they might start to withdraw from that class a little bit, not just from their peer relationships, but also from just being engaged in discussion. So if you're in that position and you're that teacher, do try to pull them out. Don't let them slip through the cracks. Don't let them disappear. Don't let them think that they don't have anything to add, but really try to actively engage them. I'm not saying call on them every time or even you know every other time, but just make sure that you're calling on them like you would any other student. And don't just focus on the ones who want to be called on, but those students as well who are kind of fading in the back. Draw them out and, and validate them. So if they give you something that's good, Tell them specifically, okay, not just that was great, but you know what, I appreciated that because you saw something that other people didn't. That was a very insightful observation. Something to make them feel like they do have some worth and some expertise. The second thing to do, obviously, is to let them know that you care, and that's very basic. Um, 
you know, maybe you're not that teacher or that school staff member or that worker who's really close to them, but maybe you know somebody who is. So caring doesn't have to be you being the person that has that conversation. Caring could be you linking the person who you know they're close to to them and having that conversation with that particular teacher or other staff member. Being cautious is important as well. Know your boundaries, know your limits. You probably cannot be their 2 a.m. phone call if they're really upset. So make sure you don't set up these unrealistic expectations for yourself in terms of how much support you can give to them. Another thing, especially if you're in a school or if you're in a local nonprofit mental health organization, know your district policy or know your organizational policy and know the law. How involved are you allowed to be? And not only that, but what is the hierarchy? What is the chain of command in terms of reporting? A lot of districts, especially here in the St. Louis area, have very specific policies that teachers and staff members are required to follow if they suspect a student could be suicidal. In a particular district I know about, even if a student mentions the word suicide or kill myself, it doesn't matter if it's offhanded or not, they're immediately swept up by the teacher and catered or, or ushered into that school social work social worker or, or school counselor. So know exactly what you're supposed to do. Also, telling an administrator is always a good idea. You know, like I said earlier, don't feel like you have to be the expert on this. So if you're concerned about a student, it is a lot better to tell somebody up front, like an administrator or a counselor, than wait for a couple of weeks until it potentially gets worse. I work with a lot of counselors who love their teachers but say, you know, unfortunately sometimes my teachers, because they are so close to the students and they do see them every day, they think that they can handle these things on their own. So then myself as a crisis worker, I don't hear about these things until it is a crisis, until we're to the point where we have to get outside care and we maybe have to get the parents involved or have to even get emergency services involved. So if you're even slightly concerned, tell somebody. If it's just a quick email, hey, I'm concerned about this particular student. I want to talk to you about it later, just so it's kind of on that school support member's radar. And also working with parents. So especially if you're a teacher, this can be a really important role. Sometimes we have counselors and social workers say, you know, unfortunately, despite the fact that the student is clearly depressed, they are telling me they're depressed, they are telling me they have a suicide plan, the parents are not taking this matter seriously. And that's not the majority of our parents, but it is some. And so what do you do from there? And I have conversations with kids as well that say, I know I'm depressed, I know I need help, but my parents say I have nothing to be depressed about so they won't get me any help. And I hate hearing that, but there's a couple of things that we can do with that as school staff members. There are very obvious signs of depression and warning signs of suicide that you can observe in the classroom. And I talked about that a little bit earlier. One specifically might be, what are they writing about? What are they talking about? That sort of thing. So you can, as a school staff member, if you know that the parents are not supportive of this, back up what that counselor or social worker is saying. So if they're showing you these warning signs in your classroom, they're falling asleep, they're not turning in their work anymore, um, they're not interacting with their peers, and they wrote this essay about how they hate their life and nothing is good. Well, there's four things, and each one of those four things directly align with a symptom of depression. If you can document those things, give those to the counselor, the counselor can say, okay, I know that you didn't think that this was a problem, but this is how they're behaving in their classroom, or if you can sit in on those meetings, that can be really helpful to getting that child connected to some serious care. Don't do a few of these things. Don't discount any reference. I think it's really easy to take statements for granted, to assume that they're not actually serious, to assume that they don't need that help, but be careful not to do that. Again, it is always better to be safe rather than sorry, so even if you're slightly concerned or a little suspicious, do something about it. Make that connection with that school support member. Don't ignore depressed students, and that's kind of the opposite of that draw the student out. Don't um, just let them slip through the cracks. Don't assume that that's just their personality or their attitude. And also, don't make promises. And this is a difficult one because we obviously all want to be encouragers of the kids that we care about. But be careful not to make promises that you don't really know anything about. So for instance, if you are in a school setting and you say to that, to that kid, all right, I know you're stressed out, but you know what? It's going to be OK. You're going to feel so much better after finals. So we're putting that thought in their mind that maybe, OK, well, maybe this is all related to this one big thing that I'm stressed out about. And maybe they're right. Maybe I will feel better. Well, that's a potential, but also there's the potential that after that event happens, they're not feeling any better. So then where does that put them? Well, I thought I was going to feel better, and I don't, so that's a little dangerous. And also, don't give up. Like I said, 
you might not make that connection the first time. That kid might not want to open up to you. And they might not ever want to open up to you, but that doesn't mean that you can't do anything. You can still make those referrals to the counselors and the social workers if you're concerned. You can still connect them to another teacher or another staff member that you know that they feel more comfortable with if you're concerned. And you can still talk to those parents, so don't give up. A few more things to be aware of. Make sure, and I've talked about this already, but make sure that you're able to read between the lines. So be aware that kids do hide things. A lot of kids are really good at pretending to feel ways that they don't. And so if you're starting to observe these symptoms, go with your gut feeling. If you feel like this kid needs some help, then don't just say, okay, well, they're smiling and they're laughing, and they're not always like this. They might most of the time be, but not always, so they're probably okay. Go with your gut. If you think they need help, again, better to be safe rather than sorry. Help eliminate the stigma. So the stigma to getting to of mental illness is a big barrier to getting help. So the little things that you can do is make yourself an approachable person. Talk about depression as being an illness. Accept it in yourself, not in yourself, but to yourself as being a disease and something that does take treatment and does take support and help to get through just like anything else would be. And create that culture, whether it be a classroom or a, or a team or um, a counseling relationship, whatever it might be with that youth, that they know that you feel that way and you're able to talk about it with them open and not you're not judging them or thinking poorly upon them. And also, and I've said this again before, don't try to fix that student or handle that situation on your own. It's very important to realize that this is a very complex issue, that you don't want to be the sole supporter of the student in their time of crisis, and that you really do need other people to support you and to support that student. So I'm going to just spend about uh, five more minutes and then we'll have about ten minutes so we can have some questions from our viewers. But I want to talk real briefly on the things that CHADS provides. So now we'll move into that resources part. CHADS uses a program called SOS or Signs of Suicide and it is not something that we developed simply because we already knew that this program was out there and it was working. It's registered with SAMHSA, it's evidence-based, they've done lots of research to make sure it's effective. We have about a 14% rate of the kids that we talk to asking for help afterwards. So we know that that's getting at those kids that have those thoughts of suicide and getting them to link with a school professional, whether it be a social worker, or a psychologist, or a counselor. But the way that this works is that it um, comes in a curriculum. So basically, CHADS presents it to all local schools, all schools in the St. Louis metro area. We do go statewide, we do go a little bit into Illinois, um, but at this point we're basically a regional organization. Those of you who do not live within that region, you can still contact me, you can still contact our organization, and we can give you referrals to potentially agencies in your area that are using this program, or we can support you in your own endeavors to, inst in to institute this program with wherever you are. But basically it's effective because it talks to the kids about what the warning signs are and what the symptoms are. And not only is it a conversational piece, but it's a DVD guide. So these kids are watching these role-playing scenarios of kids their age who are having very obvious symptoms of depression, warning signs of suicide, and then their friend, who will typically be that person anyway, is trying to help. And the first time they try to help, they're going to fail miserably, but the second time they, you will see them use that ACT technique that I talked talk to you about, except in a, in a kid-friendly way. So after the presentation for the high school, we have a depression screen form in which seven questions are asked and the kids self-score. So yes, I feel that way. No, I do not. We then tell them, depending on how many yeses they have, what the likelihood of them going through depression could be. And then they fill out a small little slip of paper that says they want to talk to the counselor or they don't. All of those slips go directly to the counselor. That way we're not just bringing up these issues with them, but we are connecting them to some support. And the counselors are very, very happy that they are meeting with kids that have never asked for help before and are getting, giving them that. So we also do teacher training. We know just like this presentation right here, I travel all over the state and give this very presentation to school staff all over to train them on what to look for. We also do parent nights as well. But in the curriculum specific, specifically, you would get a curriculum guide, so walking you through step by step how to implement this program, as well as how to use it in the classroom. You would get the depression screens, and you would also get some awareness tools, some marketing materials, that sort of thing. And that's through Screening for Mental Health. That's the organization that created this program. There's one specific for middle school, 6th through 8th, and there's one specific through high school, 9 and 10, and then there's a senior program as well. So this has been proven to have a 40% reduction in suicide attempts. Also, 145% increase in help-seeking behaviors, 
over six months, and then eight to 15% to ask for help immediately. And like I said, 14%, that's Chad's statistic. So we typically have about 14% of the kids we talk to who ask for help. So again, we instill this ACT in them. Acknowledge that your friend needs some help, show them that you care, and tell that trusted adult. And we use this program because we know that most teens are going to each other and asking for help. And most teens are aware of their friends' issues and are in social situations that we as adults are not. So that's why this program can be very, very effective. Here's how we typically suggest to do it. First, you educate the teachers and the staff and then the parents. You coordinate with the counselors, everybody gets on board, the teachers know what the kids are going to be viewing, and then we install it in the health classes. In Missouri, we have it connected to the, GR, to the GLEs so that we know that it's meeting those, um, but it's also applicable nationwide. So we suggest either 7th or 8th grade, and then we suggest the freshmen in high school or the sophomores, depending on where their health class might be. We know just real quickly that there is a connection between bullying and suicide. Yale did a study showing that bullying victims are about two to nine times more likely to attempt suicide than those who are not. Um, and we also know that there's a heavy percentage of kids who are bullied. And it's important to make that connection, though also important to remember that bullying is typically not j the only reason that someone is attempting suicide. So when we talk about that, we have to think about all the kids who do experience bullying regularly and never even have a simple thought of suicide. So it cannot be the sole reason. The Olvaeus Bullying Prevention Program, I would encourage you to look into that. That's something that Chad's starting to implement here in the St. Louis metro area as well. So if you are here and your school is interested in that, you can contact me. If you're not in this area, but you are interested in getting some kind of massive bullying prevention program s started in your school district, I would encourage you to look at that one. It's kind of at the forefront of bullying prevention right now. This is kind of how it works. You would basically administer a survey to every student in your school, and that would give you some data on where this bullying is occurring and how you might best address it. Also, you have a coordinating committee of people who begin to train the entire staff in your school so that everybody's on the same page and everyone addresses bullying in the same wa manner. The other thing that CHADS provides, and this is specific as well, kind of to the Missouri area, but you can call us as well from anywhere, we never, we never say no to help, um, is our family support program. And this comes out of a place that we recognize that there are some families who very much want to help their kids, but they just don't know how. They don't know how to navigate the mental health system, they don't know where to reach out for help, they don't know what some of this terminology and this jargon is that we in the mental health field use very loosely. So what this serves to do is connect our families with outside referrals. So people call our number and we basically refer them to other agencies and other resources. So I will put that contact information right there. So my name again is Sarah Strawn. I am the school outreach project manager so I'm in charge of all the school programming. So if anything from the bullying prevention to the SOS interested you today, you can contact me there. The family support is our social worker David Hodling and that's his information there as well. So I think we've got a few minutes left. I'd be happy to take some questions. All right. And we did have a few come in here during the presentation. So going back to when you talked about the Missouri Student Survey in the 2008, do you know what age groups were surveyed? That depends on the school district. So I believe it's middle and high school, though, typically statewide. And a, kind of a couple of variations of, of this theme here. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll put these two questions together. Um, First, the first person asked if we asked them more than once or twice, and this is asking people about suicidal ideation, I believe, mm -hmm. couldn't that push them toward suicide? And then later, um, what, are, what are some ways that schools can help the student body when one of the students dies by suicide and part of the concern is not wanting to prompt further attempts? Great questions, both of them. So the first one is a very common misnomer. If I ask somebody about suicide, is it going to put the mind, is it going to put that thought in their mind? And that's something that was a big barrier for us to even get into the schools to implement this program. But I will say, if somebody is not considering suicide, the fact that you are asking them about it, that's not going to be enough for them to make a suicide attempt. You don't have to ask them specifically about suicide either. So if you think that that's a concern, we do suggest don't be afraid to use those words. That's what common knowledge is. So be directive. So if you're thinking that they're considering suicide, don't skirt around it. Be direct. But you don't have to use that if you think it's depression. So you could just ask them what's going on. And then if you are specifically concerned that it's suicide, go ahead and ask them a couple of times. It, it would not be enough typically to push somebody to that point they are making a suicide attempt. In terms of the postvention question, um, that's a fine line because we've worked with schools who have had a suicide 
and it is hard. You don't know what to do. You want to honor that student. You want to remember them. You don't want to ignore it, but you also don't want to do what we call glorify that person's life because that can then put thoughts in other people's minds. Well, look how everybody addressed them after they were gone. They seem to be really popular now. Maybe they weren't then, but now they are. And that can kind of confuse some kids. So there's, there's some really great resources out there on postvention. Um, Hazelden, who puts out the Olvaeus Bullying Prevention Program, they did something on postvention. But I would say just a few things to take away from this presentation if you are dealing with a postvention situation. Make sure that all of the teachers have a common script that they're reading with the information that respects the family and the child, that the family wants to be communicated, no more and no less. Uh, make sure that the kids are not putting up posters and wearing t-shirts and organizing a day dedicated to this person. There should not be memorials or anything like that. Though you can push efforts into suicide prevention. So that's what we suggest to our schools. Don't make it so-and-so's day, but make it let's prevent teen suicide and maybe let's put up posters about where to get help or if you're thinking of this, here's who you can call. But don't make it about that specific person because that can make it a little bit more glorifying and that can maybe put those thoughts in some kids' minds. And then uh, stepping out of the school environment mm -hmm. for just a minute, could you provide more warning signs in a home environment that they can discuss with parents? Yeah, so discussing with parents, um, that would be, you know, how are they interacting with their, their brothers and sisters? Um, we know with some young, some young kids, they show it through acting out aggressively towards household pets and things like that. So those are some things that you might see at home. Are they isolating themselves in their room all the time? Now I know many teenagers want to be in the room, they don't always want to be out and about, um, but what exactly are they doing when they're in the room? What kind of websites are they visiting? Are they death and suicidal themes? Are they very dark? Um, you know, we talk a lot about video games and movies and those sorts of things, and it's certainly something to t make note of and pay attention to, but the important thing to remember is that usually one warning sign or symptom is not enough to be of high concern. It's usually coupled with a couple of other things. And then a question to um, groups or demographics, are overweight people more prone to commit suicide? It's an interesting question and I could not tell you the answer to that and know that I was correct, but that would be interesting to look up. Yeah, good question. All right. Well, I think that's what we've got for today. Okay. So I think, Sarah, you've done it. You've mastered it again. <laughs> Folks, thanks for joining us today. You'll see again the links below the uh, video window there, the link directly to the Chad's Coalition website and the programs that are coming up in the St. Louis area. But a lot of good resource information available to you there. Also the slides. I know some people had some compression issue viewing the slides, but that PDF file is good if you wanted to review some of the information on the slides. It did take a minute to download, but it was a able to be accessed on the site. Also, if you're interested in purchasing CEUs, that link will stay active there. Plus, we'll send it to you in a follow-up email along with those other links so that you can keep that information at your fingertips. But we thank you for your time and joining us this afternoon. And Sarah, thanks for your time and your expertise. My pleasure.